Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, we're delayed a few minutes. We're doing a show on communist China and how the devil is written all over that abomination of a government in the last 60, 70 years. So, of course, we had major technical difficulties, gremlins in the technologies, emails disappearing. Uh, anyway, this is Stephen Mosher. Um, and before we get into his bio, Stephen, thanks for coming on my show. Well, thanks for having me, Kennedy. I'm going to read uh, Mr. Mosher's bio here because it's very impressive, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, so Stephen Mosher is the president of the Population Research Institute. He's an internationally recognized authority on China and population issues, as well as an acclaimed author and speaker. He has worked tirelessly since 1979 to fight coercive population control programs and has helped hundreds of thousands of women and families worldwide over the years. In 1979, Stephen was the first American social scientist to visit mainland China. He was invited there by the Chinese government, where he had access to government documents and actually witnessed women being forced to have abortions. Lord have mercy. Mr. Mosher was a pro-choice atheist at the time, but witnessing these traumatic abortions led him to reconsider his convictions and to eventually become a practicing pro-life Roman Catholic. Praise be to God. Stephen uh, has appeared numerous times before Congress as an expert in world population, China, and human rights abuses. He's also made TV appearances on Good Morning America, 60 Minutes, The Kennedy, or the Kennedy Report, I was going to say, The Today Show, 2020, Fox, uh, and CNN News, and now he's here on this, which I'm very honored to have him. He's also the author of a best of the best-selling A Mother's Ordeal, One Woman's Fight Against China's One-Child Policy, as long as many other books. His articles have appeared in the who's who of publications, including Wall Street Journal, The Reader's Digest, Washington Post, and more. He lives with his wife, in Avera in Virginia and their nine children. That is quite the biography. Congrats. We get a round of applause for Mr. Mosher. That's, that is a very good biography there. <laughs> ah, thank you. Awesome. So the devil in communist China is the book. Ladies and gentlemen, you can find this book in the description box for this podcast. If you're watching live on YouTube and if you're listening later on when it's on Spotify or iTunes, click there. You can get it. It's just came out. Was it two days ago? That's right. Yeah. This week. Feast of uh, St. Joseph, which is wonderful. Um, that's excellent. St. Joseph is wonderful. He was my patron when I came into the Catholic Church and has been a needed support throughout the course of my life, raising a large Catholic family. That's that's beautiful. I have six children uh, of my own, and uh, hopefully we'll have some more, God willing. My wife is 35. I'm 36. We've got some years left, so maybe we'll catch up. We'll see. That's right. Don't don't stop at six. <laughs> no, no, we're not. We're not. Um, <laughs> it's not a competition, though. It's not. not yeah, it's not a competition. But maybe we'll win. No, I'm just kidding. But um, we uh, we our Honda Odyssey is full. We've got eight seats. They're all full. So we're going to have to get one of those uh, airport shuttle buses at some point. I think. That's right. We had a 15 passenger van at one point. My wife hated it, but she <laughs> but she drove it nonetheless. Yeah, exactly. Well, with the, I'm in Canada. Speaking of communist governments, and uh, with the gas prices. I'm just, oh. uh, I don't know. I'm trying to find, I don't know, some fuel-efficient one if possible. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to read a passage here from the book. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. Sorry we had some tech difficulties, but we're here now. We're going to do a, um, we're going to talk about the book for, let's say, 20, 30 minutes or whatever. And then we're going to try to field some Q&A at the end. So hold your questions to the end, my friends, because I won't look at the comments too much until then, so I don't get distracted. There's a passage here from the book. And it's a little bit lengthy, but I want to read this because I really think this sets the stage for the scope of this. And it's a, it's a very powerful passage. And Mr. Mosher writes, To say that Mao was a sociopath or a psychopath does not capture the essence of the man. He certainly had elements of both in his personality. Like a classic sociopath, he had a few friends and was antisocial in his attitudes and behavior. Like a classic psychopath, he was cold, heartless, and even inhuman to others, including his own children. For Mao, nothing was sacred except his own being. Among the ancient Chinese philosophers, the only ones who rejected all authority, the laws of both man and God, were Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu. Zhuang Tzu especially is known for his bold declaration, almost a self-deification, that I, heaven and earth, were born together and I share the same body with the universe. Zhuang Tzu was, not surprisingly, one of Mao's favorite sages. That says it all to me. This this seems like this uh, fella seems like a man who believed himself to be some sort of lord of the universe. What say you to that? 
Oh, absolutely. And you can see that in his own writings. As a young man, he wrote, uh, there are other for my own use and for my own pleasure. That is to say, he was the, the master chess player, and he felt free to move around pieces on the chessboard. The lives, playing with the lives of, of the one point, well, now 1.4 billion Chinese, as if they were nothing more than, than his playthings. And, of course, he disposed of them with, with, with absolute callousness. Uh, when there was a famine in China from 1959 to 1962, and during the course of that famine, some 45 million, 50 million people starved to death. 50 million people is a number so large you can't wrap your mind around it. And what did Chairman Mao say at the time? Well, when they began to get hungry, these tens of billions of people, he said, let them eat tree bark and grass. I prefer bread myself. I mean, Marie Antoinette was a soul of, of, of sympathy compared to Mao Zedong. Let them eat tree bark and grass. And then when they began dying in large numbers, he said, quote, deaths have benefits. They fertilize the ground as if human beings, when they died, were nothing more than compost to be added to the compost pile. Uh, he treated human, humanity as a disposable resource. In fact, I would argue the Chinese Communist Party continues today to treat the Chinese portion of humanity that it controls one out of every seven human beings on the planet that it has enslaved as a disposable re uh, resource, as a renewable resource that it can uh, kill 100 million or 200 million or 300 million, or in the case of the one child policy, kill 400 million unborn children. And they don't care. Their women, they say, will make it up in a generation. That's the callousness that was put in place by Mao himself, and I think is reflected in the system that he created because the leaders following Mao all adopted his playbook, especially the one who's in charge now, Xi Jinping. He is an absolute clone of Chairman Mao. He's not the son of Mao's loins. Mao left children all over China, which he never acknowledged. But he is the son of, of, of Mao's demonic spirit, and he models himself in everything, including the callousness, including the, 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 the terror that he's inflicted on the Chinese people. Uh, Xi Jinping is cut from the same cloth. Wow, there's so much we could say to that. Did you ever see the clip of my despicable prime minister, Justin Trudeau? Did you ever see the clip of him from the campaign trail? This, he was elected in 2015. His reign of terror will probably come to an end soon because the polls have him, uh, you know, he's going to they're going to they're going to be able to bring the, the amount of MPs that will win a seat in the liberal party, probably in a small school bus. Uh, the next election, they're going to do so poorly if it's going to happen this year or next year. Not sure. It's the parliament could be four or five years. Non-confidence votes, the whole inside baseball. Nonetheless, when he was on the campaign trail, uh, he was asked a question at a it was actually at a, a group of women business women. And he was asked who he admires, what government he admires in the world today. And he said with a straight face, he ad, uh, admires the Chinese government. And he said, because their basic dictatorship has the ability to turn an economy on a dime. Now, clearly Trudeau is very communist inspired. There's no secret with that. He literally admits it with the way that he's run our country and it is economically being destroyed right now. However... This spirit of communism has kind of spread throughout the world. Before we came on, you were saying how this Chinese, this Chinese virus of, uh, to use a pun from what's happened the last few years, this Chinese virus of communism, it really kind of is like the errors of Russia being spread throughout the world. And I think the significance of the red dragon in China and the book of the apocalypse, those sorts of things, perhaps you could talk about the spread of this uh, virus of communism as a result of Mao's efforts. Well, we, we know that uh, from the, the predictions of, of Fatima that uh, that Russia could and did spread its errors throughout the world. It spread them to Eastern Europe. It also spread them to China because without support from Stalin in the 1930s and 40s, and I'm not talking about just monetary support. Stalin was sending a huge amount of money every month to Mao Zedong in his red base in northern China called Yan'an. But also at the end of the Second World War, why did the Soviet Union invade 
Japanese-held Manchuria because it wanted to disarm the Japanese Imperial Army in Manchuria, over a million men, and turn over all of the guns, all of the ammunition, all of the gunboats, the planes, the howitzers, the tanks of the entire Japanese Imperial Army in China, turn it over to the Red Army, along with tens of thousands of troops who came in to train the Red Army soldiers, along with 200,000 North Korean communists who fought on the side of the communists in World War II. And then, of course, uh, Chairman Mao returned the favor when he helped uh, Kim invade South Korea during the Korean War a few months later. So that's how Russia spread its errors to China. China has done its best to spread its errors in the neighboring countries, starting with Korea, of course, but then spreading to Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, uh, Laos, and it has fomented uh, communist revolutions in many, many other countries, many of which have been unsuccessful, as in Indonesia in the 1960s. But nonetheless, we have, we have uh, Russia uh, and China now in an alliance, an unholy alliance, where each is supporting the other, China supporting Russia in Ukraine, expecting Russia to return the favor when it invades Taiwan. So the errors that were spoken about in Fatima continue to spread. And I would argue that, of course, we're in uh, much more dangerous waters now with the new China-Russia alliance than we were back in the 1950s with the old Sino-Soviet alliance. Because in those days, China was the weaker partner. It had almost no industrial base. Uh, the Soviet Union was the senior partner, the elder brother, as it was called at the time. Now, of course, China has the factory floor of the world on its east coast. Its export uh, sector of the economy can produce almost anything, including ships and planes and tanks. And Russia is the junior partner supplying what? Supplying raw materials, minerals, uh, oil, natural gas to fuel the furnaces of China's war machine. So, so we, are, we are indeed in, in dangerous waters the red dragon is rising. It's curious to me, you mentioned the, the book of the apocalypse. It, it has always been curious to me that the national symbol of China has been the dragon, um, because we know that that, that, that uh, symbolic meaning of the dragon also has, uh, has, has a deep meaning in Catholic eschatology as well. Yeah, that, that that exactly. Um, so yeah, on this on this theme of China and the Red Dragon, you know, I don't know if there is a an empire, a country on Earth that is as you know uh, persecutorial of Catholicism as China. I mean, there's some there's some people you know vying for the top spot there, but China is definitely at the top. And uh, I have a, a priest friend, remain anonymous, but he does missionary work. He's a traditional yeah. priest, and he goes into China and, and many other places in Asia, and the stuff he has to go through. I mean, dressing like a, you know, dressing like a layman, saying "I'm here for business," that sort of stuff, saying mass in yeah. apartment buildings and stuff, you know, that sort of thing. And he showed me, a, he showed a picture to me. He was holding a child, uh, and it was just a picture of him and a child. And he was showing me. He said, "You know why this picture is special?" And this was now. I think they can have three children. I think. And this was a child that uh, a lady had had before she was allowed to have three children. And so he explained to me kind of what they go through in order to keep their kids and, and that sort of thing. And it's obviously very difficult. Can you tell us kind of the real reality of this horror uh, of this, this child policy they've had in China? Well, uh, look, the, the big picture is this, Kennedy, that, that, that the philosophical basis of communism is hatred of God. Yeah. and hatred of God's creation and hatred of human life. Uh, the devil hates human life and he can only destroy. So what does he do? He destroys bodies, he destroys souls. And communism is inspired by hatred. Uh, Mao Zedong once said, communism is not love. Communism is a hammer that we use to crush the enemy, whether that enemy be foreign or domestic. Well, he decided in 1958, well before the beginning of the one child policy, that the state had the right to control reproduction in the same way that it controls production. That is, he said in 1958 to senior Communist Party officials, just as we have a state plan to produce tons of steel every year and, 
and uh, numbers of bicycles and cars. So we need to have a state plan to control reproduction, how many babies are born. They didn't embark upon that right away, but they did when I was in China in 1979 and 1980. They imposed almost overnight a one-child policy. Now that caught a lot of women and couples off guard because you conceived a child six months before, nine months before when it was legal to have a second child. Now all of a sudden the state is saying, your pregnancy is illegal, you must have an abortion. Mm. And it forced in those early months in the village I was living in, they arrested dozens of women for the crime of being pregnant and took them to a lockup. They held them for weeks on end. They subjected them to morning to night propaganda sessions, what we should really call brainwashing sessions. And at the end of the day, all of the women were taken in uh, by force in many cases uh, for late term, midterm and late term abortions. The, chi the child within was killed by lethal injection. The child's dead or dying body was then removed by something new in the annals of medicine. It was removed by a cesarean section abortion, a cesarean section not done to deliver a live baby, you understand, mm -hmm. but to deliver a dead or dying baby out of the mother's body and then sterilizing the woman at the same time, cutting her, her tubes, tying her tubes so that she would never again have children. This hatred of human life this view of humanity is nothing more than, you know, dead bodies have 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 value. They fertilize the ground. Is is no nowhere better manifest than in the one child policy. Continued until 2016, the total death toll, uh, I estimate, and and this was also a number given by the Chinese Communist Party itself, was 400 million. 400 million human beings died because Chairman Mao and the Chinese Communist Party decided that it was time to thin the Chinese herd. And now, of course, they have the opposite problem. Yeah. You see, communism always overreaches. And you mentioned Pierre Trudeau. I saw his famous remark that they have control over the economy and they can turn it on a dive. That's utter nonsense. Uh, they have destroyed the Chinese economy, which has been built by the hard work, the sweat, blood, and tears, the entrepreneurial ability of the most industrious people on the planet, the Chinese, who have built up China against the headwind of state control, against the massive corruption, against the, 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 the danger that your wealth could be expropriated at any time. The Chinese people have nonetheless managed to prosper a little bit over the last few decades, only now to see their economy being destroyed in real time in real time in China right now because Xi Jinping is determined to impose once again total Maoist control on society. And that means at the end of the day that all of these millionaires and billionaires who've prospered by making widgets to sell in big box stores in Canada and the United States, uh, they're all going to be taken over by the Chinese Communist Party and, and killed over time. The Chinese Communist Party is much better at producing tyranny than it is at producing the goods. And uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, with all due respect to your prime minister. You know, that's is, don't need to give is, much respect. That's living, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is, living, is living in a communist fantasy land. Yeah. Uh, the reality in China is much, much different. Oh, yeah. He's, he's living in a fantasy land of epic proportion. Um, it's unbelievable. It's funny. I was writing an article today. This is kind of off topic, but I was writing an article today for LifeSite News, and uh, the RCMP, which has been taken over by the communist Chinese in Canada, if you follow the news in yeah. Canada, I mean, literally, yeah. it's crazy. You know, they uh, they just, uh, the reason that we found out, the reason why Trudeau called the election in 2021, when no one wanted one, the turnout was record low. I mean, it was the middle of, you know, the the pandemic so-called, so everyone was not you know, locked in their homes or whatever. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. But they called the election because uh, it was being unearthed that the Trudeau government was giving these top officials from the Chinese government direct access to. We have a lab in Winnipeg that's like a Wuhan. It's one of those international labs for that's all the right. things. I've, I've, I've written about that lab. Yeah. Yeah. And so they were giving, you know, just, oh, come on in. You know, it's like, oh, what, what's going to happen? What, what, what could be the problem here? Giving the Chinese officials access to all of our virological secrets and things. And what could happen? No, 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 no problem there. Anyway. Yeah. They're just insane. So. 
this is fascinating because so my children, we homeschool our kids and, and, and uh, we have this CD series called the story of the world. It's a very common, many families have bought this over the years and it's kind of this story of the world, history of the world. And, and when they talk about China and the antiquity, you know, yeah. when you, when you yeah. read philosophers like Confucius, I mean, he's up there in my opinion and wisdom with the Aristotles of the world. This is a man who understood the natural law. This is, you know, one of the blessed pagans, let's call it like that. He really had this understanding of nature and law and commandment and, and, and heaven and earth. But this, this is the opposite. So how do we get from China being this ancient civilization with a lot of wisdom and greatness to it, uh, to having this veritable demon and this demonic philosophy? What's the transition there? Well, the transition happened a long time ago. And it happened during a period in China called the Warring States period, which ran from about 800 BC to 200 BC when China was first unified under the Qin dynasty from where we get the word China. And there were philosophers like Confucius and Mencius who were virtuous pagans, we might call them. Uh, Confucius, for example, uh, had the silver rule. Do not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. Not the golden rule, right? Uh, but the next best thing. And, and gave lots of good moral advice about how rulers were to be treated uh, how rulers were to treat their people as their children, and the children would have looked up to the emperor, their kings as fathers, elder brothers, were to be able to be in a position of authority over younger brothers, uh, husbands over wives, and so it was a it was a uh, a system of social order that he set up, but unfortunately it did not carry the day. Mm. Instead, you had hundreds of feudal principalities fighting among themselves, uh, barons and dukes and finally kings fighting a war of all against all for 500 long years. And the school of philosophy that came to dominate was called legalism. Mm -hmm. And what's legalism? Well, legalism said that the king who is going to win this war of all against all has to concentrate all power into his hands. He has to have a standing army. He has to control the production of iron for weapons. He has to control food and, and, and salt. He has to have penal camps to put dissenters in. Um, those uh, concentration camps, by the way, built the first iteration of the Great Wall. He has to have certain books allowed. The legalist books were allowed that books of computing, competing philosophies like Confucius and Mencius had to be burned. Uh, you had to have song and dance troops, propaganda troops going around the countryside, ensuring that everyone was singing your praises. And you had to be deified. You had to be treated by your people as a god. And you had to use 10 punishments for every one reward. So if you take all that together, Kennedy, you've got a kind of proto-totalitarianism. So I've argued in, in several books now that China's governing philosophy for the last 2,000 years was not Confucian. That was the silken garment that the emperors wore. Obey me because I'm the father to you uh, and the people are my children. So you must obey me. But underneath, underneath that silken costume was the iron scaffolding of legalism, a huge standing army of one million, song and dance troops, control over what you could say, where you could go, concentration camps, building the great canals and the great wall. Uh, the list goes on and on. You, you had uh, political commissars in the military to make sure the generals didn't become too ambitious. All the things we associate with modern Marxist-Leninism were actually invented in China 2,000 years ago. Hmm. And so the emperors would say things like, we are Confucian on the outside, but legalist on the inside, which is tantamount to saying, we're Confucius on the outside, we pretend to be benevolent leaders, you have to follow us because you're our children, do the right thing. But on the inside, they were totalitarians. They used brutal methods of control, including if you rebelled against the emperor, uh, they would kill your family out to the fifth generation. That means not just you and your brothers and sisters, but your first cousins, second, third cousins were all gone. The whole clan was killed if you dared to oppose the emperor. So this was, they present the silicon costume as the governing philosophy of China, but if you look deeper into it, 
you see a kind of proto-totalitarianism. That's why Mao in the 1920s and the other communists, instead of doing what Sun Yat-sen did, the other founding father of modern China, and look to the United States and the separation of powers and the constitution, which Sun Yat-sen did, he looked in the other direction. He looked at the Soviet Union, but he also looked back at Chinese history. And that's how he came up with, with the uh, Communist Party's uh, governing philosophy. It came in part from Stalin and Lenin and Marx and Engels, but it also came from deep, deep in Chinese history where human rights have never existed. Mm. You say in the book, I'm not going to argue that Chairman Mao or his chief followers were possessed by the devil. Uh, I have, and I understand that because that's impossible to prove anyway in a, in a book where you're trying to right. cite things. But right. you, you also say, I've come across no evidence that Mao himself directly engaged in anything resembling a seance, a satanic ritual, or black magic. Still, as a child, he was once dedicated to a stone god, small g, of sorts that was thought to have protective powers. Of course, we're just speculating here, but demonic influence on Mao, what do you think? Well, I think that, 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 that uh, under the ancient uh, Taoist folk religion of China, uh, there is an animistic element. That is to say, you, you, you believe that there are spirits that live in rocks, and especially striking rocks or trees. Or, or uh, There was an outcropping, a rock outcropping, a monolith about 10 feet high, not far from Mao's village that was thought, thought to contain a, a spirit. And at the foot of that rock was a spring. And so uh, people would go to that spirit from Mao's village and plead uh, for that spirit to help them. Now, I'm very leery <laughs> because I read the Bible of anything resembling <laughs> uh, you know, a spirit. You don't yeah. want to have any contact with the spirit world. But Mao's mother took him at the tender age of three made him get down on his knees and kowtow, that is to say, knock his head on the ground nine times, and, and she renamed him. She rechristened him. It was a second baptism. The name he was given at birth was Mao Zedong, which mm. we all knew. But he was given a new name by his mother. He was called um, um, the third son of the monolith, Shirsan Yadza. Hmm. And that's what she called him, and he was very proud of that name. Now, was he in a way consecrated to a demonic spirit? Just look at his subsequent behavior. Yeah. He rebelled against God. He rebelled against man. He often described himself as lawless and godless, and he certainly was. He abided by no law except, uh, you know, whatever he wanted to do was, was what he did. And he recognized no God. Uh, he believed that Christian missionaries, by the way, including Catholic missionaries, were terrorists mm. and should be eliminated from the Chinese landscape. And I think he did that in part because the communism, the basis of communism is always the, the rejection of God. Yeah. Uh, but, but he did it also because he himself thought of himself as a kind of minor deity and he certainly wanted to be thought, he wanted to be deified in the eyes of the people, the way the uh, Chinese emperors had always in history bolstered their authority by claiming divine status. We saw that in ancient Rome as well, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, that was exactly it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good point. And uh, uh, yeah, look at what the ancient uh, emperors did to the Christians. I mean, they, you know, all the ter terrible things they didn't, they didn't have the medical means to do the the same types of I know they did have various types of sterilizations and abortions in the ancient world. They're more rudimentary and, and not as surgical, but but the same demonic spirit was definitely there. Let's put it that way. And to wanting to destroy Christ's church. Um, OK, I want to talk about two more things. We've, we're at a half an hour now and I want to go to questions in about 10 minutes or so. So I want to talk about two more things before we do. Uh, but before we do that, I do have to give myself a shameless plug here, Stephen, for a trip that I'm leading. This is a happy note. Uh, and we'll get back to the doom and gloom of China in just a second. But I'm going to Italy this fall. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the Roman Empire, uh, we're going. I'm going to Italy this fall on a pilgrimage with Father uh, Albert Calio, a traditional Dominican. We're doing a pilgrimage to Europe, to Italy, I should say, Rome, Amalfi Coast, Florence, Assisi, all the hot spots. 
uh, all Catholic shrines, no Pachamamas allowed on the trip. It's going to be great. And I'll just play a, a, a quick, uh, a quick promo for that here, ladies and gentlemen. The trouble in Rome, it is easy to forget about one unshakable fact. Our church is the Roman Catholic Church, and Rome is the Eternal City. What a perfect time to go on a pilgrimage to the Eternal City and the other monumental sites of Catholic heritage in beautiful Italy. Join Father Albert Calio and me this November as we tour through the shrines of Italy and the Amalfi Coast as we attend daily Mass in the Old Rite in the footsteps of St. Peter and St. Francis. Click the link in the description to register for this once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to discover the heart of the Catholic faith in the heart of the old Roman Empire. Ladies and gentlemen, go to kennedyhall.ca slash Italy or click the link in the description. And while you're down in the description box, make sure you pick up a copy of this book, The Devil in Communist China from Stephen Mosher from Mao down to Xi. You can find a link for that. It's hot off the press a couple days. It is a it's a great book. And uh, Tan does make a very nice book. I have to say, whoever they use for their printer, it works out very nicely. So it's a great thing. All right. There's a section in your book where you talk about the Ten Commandments and there's an inversion of those um, as so like the Ten Commandments of the Communist Manifesto. And I thought I would read some of these because we know these are common in communism, but it's astonishing to see how many of these have been enshrined in our society as well. So number one and number two, the abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. And number two is, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. So income tax, it, well, I, I know this, but maybe the viewers don't, but income tax is really a communist idea. What's the background on that? Do you know? Well, the, the, uh, uh, the idea of the graduated income tax, of course, is, is a, a gradual expropriation of the wealth. That is to say, unless you engage in an open, deadly revolution, you're not going to be able to to completely confiscate all of the wealth of the, the wealthy. Uh, but by a graduated income tax, you the idea was that you would gradually achieve the kind of income leveling that uh, that communism purports to be all about. And of course, <laughs> communism is not about that at all, because you have today in China and in Cuba and in other communist countries, you have more concentration of wealth in the hands of senior officials than you ever did under any capitalistic system of organizing the economy. I mean that literally. You had, for example, Premier Wen Jiabao, who was premier from 2002 to 2012, leave office with a fortune of $2.3 billion after serving as a Communist Party official with a uh, a monthly salary of about five thousand uh, dollars for decades. Where did that money come from? Well, it came from bribes. It came from corruption. He was selling generalships to colonels. You wanted to become a one-star general, you had to pay a million dollars. You wanted a second star, it was several million dollars more, and so on and so forth. This is so common in China that there are practically schedules of payments that you make to be appointed the head of a uh, prefecture, to be a head, appointed the head of a township, to be appointed the head of a, a province or some ministry within a province. One sixth of all the wealth of China uh, goes to corruption, that's 16%. That may not sound like a lot, but another one sixth of the wealth of China goes to support the Communist Party, which lives off the blood, sweat, and tears of the Chinese people. So taken together, one third of everything that the Chinese make goes to pay their salaries, the salaries of party officials, pay for their resorts, pay for their beach trips, their foreign junkets, and winds up in their pockets as well. And of course, they're all silent partners in the major enterprises in China. You can't survive as a uh, billionaire in China unless you have very close ties to senior uh, party officials who provide you with protection yeah. in the same way the mafia provides you with protection. And one final point on that, the most dangerous place to be a billionaire in the world today is China, because billionaires have a bad habit in China of jumping off you know, the 25th floor of a 25-story building, uh, supposedly committing suicide. They get uh, billionaires have a bad habit of disappearing, uh, being charged with crimes, 
um, and of course the official that charges them with crimes uh, will then have access to their wealth. So it's a very dangerous place to uh, to be successful. That's why there's there are trillions of dollars in wealth and tens of millions of people who are desperate to get out of China because they want to escape the clutches of the Chinese Communist Party, which has closed the doors to that kind of exodus by and large. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if it's one sixth of uh, our taxes here in Canada go to corruption. It's definitely not insignificant. And uh, speaking of um, funding all of the corruption in the government, as our very uh, communist loving uh, prime minister has been in power, uh, if he was a regular person, a regular citizen, he would be in jail by now. He's been yeah. caught with what they call ethics violations, which it means a crime. But, uh, you know, if, if I were to get caught in an ethics violation, I'd go to prison. If the prime minister gets caught in an ethics violation, he uses taxpayer money to pay for legal fees to call, you know, to do whatever. And yeah, same thing. Um, these two really stood out to me. So centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly and centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. So the, the Chinese economy, the idea of having a communist economy, people really don't understand what that means. You know, we have this, you know, freshman year university communist professor idea that it's really just all about sharing money and so forth. That's not what it's about at all. What is a what is a, a communist economy really like? Well, uh, a communist economy is best described uh, by the villagers among whom I lived way back in 1979, 1980. Now, remember, I was the first American social scientist allowed to do research in China. I was picked as a very young scholar because I can read, write and speak Chinese. Um, and so I was living among the villagers. And when they came to trust me, I began to find out all kinds of interesting things, not just about the the way that the landlords and rich peasants had been executed uh, by the Communist Party when it came to power, not just how anyone uh, with a gun was not just had the gun taken away by the Red Army, but was themselves executed because if they had a gun, uh, they, they could not be trusted. Uh, and, and all of the other cultural revolution, a great leap forward, all of the other purges and persecutions uh, over the decades. They, um, they also told me that um, the old gentry, the old village leaders were not bad men. And many of them were very good men. And some of them, even, even the bad ones, had limited power over you. Uh, they couldn't dictate you know, where you lived and, and they couldn't prevent you from traveling or even emigrating, leaving the country. The new rulers, he said, uh, were much harsher, the Communist Party. It dictated where you could live. It dictated whether or not you could leave the village. You needed a travel pass to leave the village. Uh, it dictated what you would plant and when you would harvest. And, and, uh, and they called the, their new rulers the big landlord. Now, Kennedy, the worst attack word in the Chinese communist vocabulary in rural China was landlord. You yeah. call someone a landlord. I mean, you're calling them the scum of the earth. For the villagers to say that the Communist Party was the big landlord, you have to understand the, the disdain, the hatred that, that was embedded in that phrase, the big landlord, because the big landlord took everything away from them. It took their land away from them. It took their homes away from them. It took their children away from them. It took their, uh, their freedom away from them, their freedom to travel. It took their ability to sell their own sell their own crops and make a profit. You had to turn over everything to the state collection station, which then turned around and made a huge profit by and, and gave you nothing but peanuts. So um, I know they would have loved peanuts. Peanuts are uh, fine in China. They gave you nothing but what, what they called broken rice. They called it black rice because it was the leavings from the mill. The good rice was sold down the river to Hong Kong. The black rice, the broken rice, the husk and everything were given to the local people to eat as their reward for working 365 days a year in the fields for the big landlord. So it is a tyranny. It is an unadulterated tyranny. It is a tyranny that results in tremendous unconscionable concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a very, very few people who run roughshod over the rights and freedoms of, of the rest of us. 
uh, communism is, 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 a, is a pipe dream. Uh, but it's a very effective way if you are an ambitious leader, uh, whether you're Pierre Trudeau or Mao Zedong or somebody else, or, or, or Fidel Castro, for example, um, it's a very effective way of, of seizing and holding control forever. Well, speaking of Pierre and Fidel Castro, we'll leave it to the audience to decide who's the real father of Justin. But uh, that's another conversation for another day. <laughs> Uh, last thing in the Communist uh, Ten Commandments, and then we'll talk about the situation of the Catholic Church in China, especially under this, uh, a few years ago, this deal that uh, Pope Francis and his uh, Vatican made with the Chinese Communist. Um, free education, free public education. You know, we herald public education in our so-called democratic societies as being this wonderful, amazing thing. Everyone gets an education, isn't that great? But really, the roots of this idea that the state's going to run your education and everyone's going to be... Uh, required to attend does have its roots in this idea of communism. What's the uh, what's the background there? Oh well, Lenin said, "You give me your children for three years, and I will make them communists forever." Uh, the communists have always emphasized education because uh, their kind of education, however, is is what we call brainwashing. Mm -hmm. In fact, you, people should know that brainwashing was actually invented by the Chinese Communist Party in the 1930s. The original phrase in Chinese is Xi now, which literally means wash brain, brainwashing. It's where it comes from. And, and uh, I'll tell you a story about uh, one trip I made to China uh, back in 2010. This was before Xi Jinping came to power and the walls began to close in again uh, after the Maoist fashion. Uh, I visited a number of Catholic villages. These are villages that have been Catholic for centuries. The missionaries came in 1648 to 1750, 1850, evangelized in the village, built churches and a school and orphanages and a medical clinic. And uh, in many cases, the entire village uh, became Catholic. Those villages, because of the unity of, of spirit and purpose of the people in those villages, uh, some of those villages have survived literally decades of persecution. Well, by 2010, this one particular village had succeeded in evading the population control restrictions by and large. I went to the village and there were lots of children running around. I said, how did, how did you manage to have second, third and fourth children? The village head, who was also the chairman of the parish council, by the way, said, oh, when the population control police come, we hide our children and pregnant women. He also rebuilt the church that had been destroyed in the 1960s during the Cultural Revolution, beautiful new church. And they had a convent there uh, where the sisters were doing good works. And then they tried to open a school. And Kennedy, that was where the local government said, no, you can have your church, you can run your little medical clinic, you can do these other uh, good works if you want, and we'll ignore the fact that you have all these children running around, but you are not allowed to have a school. Mm. And the county official came down on them. They ignored the county official because they, they didn't have enough power to do much about what the village was doing. And then they brought in the prefectural officials who said, I'm just, we're just going to arrest the whole lot of you unless you close down the school. And the pressure was too great. And, uh, and they did in fact close down their Catholic school in the village. You see, that was a bridge too far for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, even during a period of relative relaxation, today, of course, churches are being torn down. Priests and bishops are being hounded. Uh, Bishop Ma has been in, in, uh, in, uh, in solitary confinement now for over a decade because when he uh, took up the bishopric of Shanghai, he announced he was leaving the Catholic Patriotic Association the congregation in the church jumped to its feet and applauded him for minutes on end. The local communist minders who were there at every church service watching him immediately arrested him and he's been held uh, incommunicado ever since. Lots of stories like that of the persecution that's going on in China, which the Sino-Vatican Agreement has not improved and in many ways has made worse. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to ask you, so... Um... Maybe, maybe give us a, 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 an elevator pitch kind of background of, you know, we hear about this Sino-Vatican Sino agreement, this, this uh, China, China, Chinese government, Patri Chinese patriotic church 
and a Vatican agreement about that. For a lot of people, though, they don't really know, you know, what is the Chinese Patriotic Church versus the underground church, and, and how has that relationship changed and harmed the faithful since that agreement was made a few years ago? Well, the, the, the goal of the Chinese Communist Party has always been to eradicate all religious sentiment from China and to replace belief in, in God uh, and, and replace the Catholic Church and Protestant churches in China, which with what I call the Church of China itself. They want the Chinese people to worship, in a sense, the Chinese Communist Party, who are the acolytes in this Church of China. And of course, the Pope, quote unquote, of this Church of China would be none other than the Communist Party leader, Xi Jinping himself. Now, when I learned that the Sino-Vatican agreement was being negotiated back in the spring of 2018, I went to Rome and I had a, an hour-long meeting with the Cardinal Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Perelin, who was very gracious and, and listened to me explain at great length why it was a very bad idea to sign any agreement with the Chinese Communist Party, both because they would violate the agreement and secondly, because they would misrepresent the agreement. You see, we didn't have the terms of the agreement. The terms of the agreement, even today, five years, six years later, are secret. We don't know exactly what the Vatican and the Chinese Communist Party agreed on. We think we know in broad outline that it concerns the appointment of bishops. But in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, this secret agreement has been presented by the Chinese Communist Party to the faithful in China as an order from the Pope himself to join a schismatic group called the Catholic yeah. Patriotic Association. Now, I don't believe that the Sino-Vatican Agreement says that, but nobody knows because it's a secret agreement. So, as I told Cardinal Perlin over five years ago, uh, it will be misrepresented, it will be violated, mm -hmm. it will redound to the harm of the Chinese faithful. Hmm. It will not provide, I think the idea was a naive idea that it would provide a safe space inside the churches for Catholics to freely practice their faith. Hmm. Well, the Catholics have certainly been herded inside the remaining churches because it is a crime for a priest to go out on the street and bless someone. It is a crime for a priest to go into someone's home and bless someone's home or to carry out any religious rite, um, uh, baptism, uh, hold a secret mass. Everything has to be done within the confines of the church. Young people are not supposed to be allowed in the church, and the church itself is not supposed to be allowed to do any social work at all. Uh, that is, no free medical clinics, no free uh, food kitchen, no... Uh, no orphanages, uh, none of the other things the Catholic Church has always done in China in response to great need. Uh, none of those things are allowed. So the church is to be purely uh, a building in which the mass is held, you know, once a week on Sunday. And this last Christmas, in parts of China, uh, Catholics went to celebrate Christmas, the birth of our Savior, and found the churches locked. And local Communist Party officials said, you must not celebrate uh, December 25th. Uh, you should celebrate December 26th. Well, what happened on December 26th? Well, in 1893, Mao Zedong, who grew up to become the, the, the third son of the monolith, uh, a man of stone with a heart of stone, was born on December 26th. And so the faithful were told they should celebrate his birthday and not uh, the birth of Christ. And if you go now to some of the few Taoist temples that still survive in parts of China, you will find on the altar where all the statues of the gods of Chinese history are displayed, you will find life-size gold statues, gold painted statues of uh, Chairman Mao. And people are encouraged to bring food and burn incense before Chairman Mao. Um, so uh, once again, they're trying to deify uh, the dead, the dead quote unquote emperor. Uh, they're trying to 
uh, create their own religion, uh, the Church of China, as I say, which is run by the Chinese Communist Party. That's the end goal. Yeah. And the Sino-Vatican Agreement is sim simply an instrument to, to co-opt and control and gradually eliminate Catholicism in China. Uh, they won't succeed, of course. Right. But it is, it is heartbreaking, I think, for, for me to hear Catholics in China say, you know, as bad as the persecution was, they say, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, during other hard times, uh, at least we knew that the Vatican supported us. <sighs> now we can no longer be sure. Yeah. Wow. What a, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a terrible, terrible feeling. I have one uh, quick story here, and then we'll go to some questions. If people have some good questions about your time in China. Uh, I have a family, a family member who spent a lot of time in Africa in, I think, the 70s and 80s, setting up telecom for some European countries. Yeah. And so he dealt with uh, Huawei as they were kind of going, or the state Chinese, uh, you know, uh, yes. telecom, whatever. Yeah. So funny story. Uh, in Africa, especially back in this time of a lot of more uh, tumult, uh, he was in one of the cities, I think, in Kenya or something. And there was a there was a, a coup, as tends to happen. Some rebel force was trying to take over. So he's at the international hotel, and they tell him all go to the basement. It's all businessmen and and government officials, and they give him a bunch of drinks to just keep them happy while there's bullets flying around. And and uh, there was this one Chinese official who he said he'd always have problems with. He'd sign a contract. And then they would, uh, d you know, they wouldn't honor the contract. They sign a contract. They wouldn't honor the contract. Yeah, yeah, so he's yeah. having some drinks with this fella. He's got let his guard down. And the fella says from China, he says, listen, you Westerners, he's Canadian, but he called him American. You Americans, you don't understand. When we sign a contract in China, that is the beginning of negotiations. And uh, right. so there's this completely different mindset of what an agreement even means. So it makes perfect sense that this agreement would be ambiguous, not followed, dishonored. Who cares? Because it's just a piece of paper in their minds. Um, yeah, a absolutely. I've, uh, that's a story that, that I've now heard for, uh, you know, four decades. Yeah. American companies go into China with the idea they're going to negotiate a win-win agreement. And in China, that has become a joke because uh, in Chinese parlance, a win-win agreement is an agreement in which you win at the negotiating table because you negotiate favorable terms uh, in the agreement itself for your side, the Chinese side. Right. And then you win again after the agreement is signed because you then promptly cheat. So that's that's what win-win means in 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 the uh, in the communist Chinese context. And and of course, given the duplicity of the Chinese Communist Party. The fact that its ideology is a complete fabrication, a complete lie, its history is a complete fabrication and a complete lie. The Chinese Communist Party, in a rare burst of candor, actually admits that. It admits in a secret uh, directive in 2012, published after Xi Jinping came to power, that, that uh, those two things constitute a mortal peril to the survival of the Chinese Communist Party. What two things? Well, an accurate account of the history and an accurate account of the ideology constitute a mortal peril to the Chinese Communist Party. Why? Because they're both lies. They're both total fabrications. <laughs> Amazing. Question from someone. When was the last time you were in China? Uh, I was in China right before Xi Jinping took power. And Xi Jinping took power in late 2012 and early 2013. And up until that point in time, it had been possible and safe uh, for people like myself <laughs> who, are, who have long been on the blacklist in China. You know, back in uh, the early 1980s, when I began writing about the atrocious human rights violations in the barbaric one-child policy, forced abortions, forced sterilizations, forced IUD insertions and the like. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party declared that I had not been doing research in China, properly speaking, that I had been spying. Ah. I had been spying, so they declared me to be a spy. And yet, in the 80s, 90s, and in the first years of this century, it was still possible if you crossed over a remote border station in the middle of the night when the computers were down 
and you had a new passport and a new visa, that it was possible to get into China uh, and, and, and visit some of the projects that we had started there. And, and in the 90s, the early years of this century, we opened a couple of orphanages in China. Quite proud of that fact because we were taking care of some of the little abandoned baby girls uh, who were abandoned by the sides of the road by parents who were limited to one child and mm -hmm. desperate that that one child be a son. Uh, we actually helped to build a couple churches in China when it was possible to build churches in China. Uh, now, of course, that's no longer possible. Mm -hmm. After Xi Jinping took power, the walls began to close in and it was no longer possible to do those kinds of things. And uh, there are Canadians, as you probably know, and some Americans of Chinese extraction and Australians and people from other Western countries being held hostage in China today on false charges. Mm -hmm. So it would be extremely dangerous for me to go right now. And um, so I've, I, I haven't, uh, I haven't gone in, uh, in recent years. Yeah. Makes sense. Another question. Um, so liberalism and communism are kind of like, you know, first cousins. So how do we fight communism as Catholics without supporting the liberal paradigm? I think, I think the logic there is we always, you know, we seem to, okay, we're going to fight communism, but then we have to adopt a lot of these similar policies by these democratic elected officials and so forth. So how do you kind of navigate that? What do you think about that? Well, I, I see things in, in, in fairly stark terms um, because I think that, uh, you know, Chairman Mao said that communism is not love. Communism is a hammer hmm. that we use to crush the enemy. Uh, communism is a philosophy based on hate. And, and he admitted that in his writings. If you read, if you read his writings, um, he's always looking for enemies because the communist system feeds on the energy released by, uh, in the destruction of, of new enemies whether it be a new, a new uh, ethnic group, uh, whether it be Catholics, whether it be Protestants, whether it be uh, capitalists, whatever. The communist system needs an enemy, always. It needs to identify uh, five or 10% of the population and set about to destroy them just to maintain the muscular tone of the system, you see, and just to make sure that the rest of the population is terrorized into silence. It's interesting to me that uh, in reading uh, the works of Archbishop Fulton Sheen, uh, he agrees with Mao Zedong on this point. Uh, of course, <laughs> Archbishop Fulton Sheen and Mao Zedong agree on nothing else, right? They have, it's hard to imagine two men who have less in common than the great Archbishop and, uh, and the brutal dictator of China, the killingest man in human history. But uh, nonetheless, they strongly agreed on, on one thing. Communism, they both insisted, was inspired not by love, but by hate. In fact, I quote uh, uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen saying, in contrast to the Christian philosophy of forgiveness, there exists for the first time in the history of the world a philosophy and a political and social system based not on love, but on hate, and that is communism. So we want to build a Christian civilization of life and love. Uh, communism wants to build a civilization based on hate that is destructive of life, that feeds on hate, um, and, and, and it's fueled by hate. So um, I don't see, in the political science classes of our universities, we see these descriptions of these different political systems, and you have communism, you have socialism, you have liberalism, progressivism, cultural Marxism, capitalism, and so forth. Um, the, it, it, it is always presented like some kind of continuum, yeah. Kennedy, where, where everything is shades of gray. There are no absolutes. There, there is no absolute good. There is no absolute evil. Everything is shades of gray. Morals are relative. Ethics are situational. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Communism is out and out evil. Yes. And it is a philosophy based on hate. And anyone who winds up Anyone who rejects God, whether they describe themselves as a socialist or a liberal, is eventually going to wind up um, as a practicing 
communist. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the dividing line. And the dividing line runs through cultures, it runs through societies. The dividing line between good and evil runs through every human heart, as yeah. you well know. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of a system that is based on hatred and based on death and based on destruction, that is diabolically inspired in this sense, God created the world and created human life and, 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 and wanted us to be fruitful and multiply. The devil can create nothing. He can only destroy. His greatest victory is the destruction of souls. But second to that is the destruction of bodies. And you see in communism, the killingest idea in human history, a half billion people in China have perished because of communism. That's, that's, that's a real number. Yeah. 500 million people. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as well, We've been talking about this book, the, the Devil in Communist China. The book is available in the description box. We're going to do two more questions. We're coming up on an hour here, and I know you've got things to do and and, uh, and whatnot. So I really appreciate your time. And uh, here's a question from Kristen. She says, "How many people? How many Chinese people have access to mass said by true faithful priests?" I guess the distinction there is, you know, there's probably going to be some communist infiltration of the Patriotic Church, obviously. So what's the access to actual kind of good? solid Catholicism like for the average Chinese Catholic? When you grow up in a system like China's, you become very, very aware of who around you you can trust. You, you develop very sensitive political antenna. Mm -hmm. You know who you can associate with, you know who you can trust. And so the Catholics in China uh, for decades have had to operate in a very, very hostile environment and protect each other and especially protect their priests. Hmm. So that that up until the signing of the Sino Vatican Agreement, it was almost always possible to go to a mass celebrated by a priest who was faithful to the magisterium. Everyone knew who they were. Everyone knew who the bishops and the priests were who made compromises. I mean, back in the 90s, you walked into the basement of the North Cathedral in Beijing, there's a, a bookstore there run by nuns. And, uh, and the nun asked a friend of mine in the bookstore, um, would you like to meet the bishop? And, and my friend said, well, no, because, uh, be, because the bishop of Beijing is not recognized by the Vatican. And the nun said, and this is in the North Cathedral in Beijing in the capital city, the nun said, oh, we don't mean him. He's made too many compromises. Me, we, we mean the real bishop of Beijing. And, you know, they arranged for a meeting and a few hours later in comes this elderly gentleman walking with a cane with no outward sign that he was the bishop. And yet he was. And they all knew who he was. They all respected him and they all respected his authority. That's the way things were before the Sino Vatican agreement. Now, of course, some of the good priests and some of the good bishops have been told that the Vatican is insisting that they join the Patriotic Church and that they, they, they register with the government in this way. And so uh, it, it, is not, it is not a happy time for, for Catholics in China. The faith will survive, uh, but we need to pray for our brothers and sisters in the faith in, in China today. They suffer greatly. Amen to that. Last question. Talking about communism, of course, we're going to bring up the topic of Freemasonry. In your research, have you found any connections between uh, Freemasonry in any explicit way and the communist Chinese situation? Well, you know, th there are, are different... Any ideology that rejects God is going to wind up making the same fundamental error. Uh, it's going to wind up making consciously or unconsciously a, a Faustian bargain with the devil. Mm. Uh, you know, the ancient, the, 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 the ancient promise of the ancient serpent. You know, if you eat of the, 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 the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be as gods. Well, no. Uh, if, you, if you attempt to become a god, uh, you will surely destroy yourself. Yeah. And we see societies being destroyed by communism. Uh, even as the even as the leaders of the country live like kings, even as the leaders of the country have people executed so that they can get a new heart or a new liver 
or new kidneys to keep themselves alive as they go into their 80s and 90s. Um, the, the, uh, the system itself will eventually collapse of its own weight. Um, my, my great fear, however, is that we have many elites in our country, not just in Pierre Trudeau, but, but other politicians who admire the Chinese Communist Party system. Why do they admire it? Well, they're politicians who would like to stay in power forever. And they see that Xi Jinping has life tenure. Uh, they're politicians who want to become wealthy as a result of the power they control. They see the senior leaders of the Chinese Communist Party are all multi, multi-billionaires. Um, and they see a system that uh, enables them to exert absolute control over the majority of the population and, uh, and destroy democracy while purporting to save it. Hmm. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a dangerous time that we live in. The threat comes from overseas, but the threat we also face, I think, at home, hmm. supported by, funded by, in part, the Chinese Communist Party. There's been tremendous amount of money spent by the Chinese Communist Party's United Front Department. This is the organization within the Chinese Communist Party that's now responsible for the Catholic Church in China, co-opting it and hollowing it out from the inside. They're also responsible for buying newspapers, bribing politicians, buying radio stations and, and disseminating propaganda and buying friends and influence overseas in countries like our own. And, and the Chinese Communist Party is spending huge sums of money to accomplish this and to destroy our own societies from within. So dangerous times that we live in, perilous times that we live in, um, we, we must all pray more. Amen to that. And uh, one thing I'm going to take away, one of the many things from this interview, is you mentioned this interaction with this bishop and I call immediately made me think of the Aryan crisis um, where you would have bishops who had cathedrals and then you would have the uh, and they had compromised with the heresy. Yeah. And then you had yeah. the Athanasius's and then the St. Eusebius's of the world who history recognizes as the true bishop as they stepped up in a crisis. So may God raise up, may God raise up some Athanasius's in China, if that makes sense. Uh, and we yeah. see the restoration. So, yeah. This has been wonderful. This is a real pleasure. You know, I uh, I get to, sometimes I get to talk to some pretty interesting individuals, and this is definitely the top of my list. So, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, again, this book, The Devil and Communist China, from Mao down to Xi. You can find this book in the description box for this podcast, whether you're listening to it on Spotify or iTunes or watching on YouTube. As always, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless you all.